Trenton's season of change continues. Hi, everybody. It's Reporters Roundtable. I'm David Cruz. Our panel this week, Matt Friedman is reporter for Politico and author of the New Jersey Playbook. Brent Johnson is the politics reporter for NJ Advance Media. And P. Kenneth Burns is the South Jersey reporter for WHYY. We'll hear from the panel in just a few minutes, but we begin today with the latest departure from the legislature in a year that is shaping up to be one of historic change. And he ought to know. Assemblyman Ralph Caputo made his debut in the legislature when he was a 20-something-year-old back during the Johnson administration. He's calling it quits at 82 years of age, and Ralph Caputo joins us now. Assemblyman, good to see you, man. Hi, David. Thank you. You're right. I was very young, 26. Yes, I so the youngest you, in the history of New Jersey at that time. You were. I don't know how I got there, but I did. That's a good question. I mean, how does someone get in? Uh, a, a, what were you, 26 at the time? Yeah. So, what did somebody say? Hey, Ralph, you're not doing anything. Why do you run for the assembly? Well, it didn't happen exactly like that. <laughs> you know? So, how much different is it today to be a lawmaker in New Jersey than it was back then? Well, times are uh, simpler then. Uh, things were not as complex. We didn't have uh, the technology that we have today. We didn't have the staff that we had. There were no district offices in those days. In fact, I had the first district office down the street from where I'm at right now, but I paid for it out of the funds that I raised. Hmm. And after me, uh, the state decided to uh, support that, and, they were, and it was a good move, and I think legislators should have their offices. Uh, they can do a lot more for their constituents, et cetera. And the big difference in those days is that when you said something, you kept your word. Uh, that's a very important part of being a, a political person, whether you be a legislator or whatever. We always hear also that uh, you all used to hang out a little bit more. doesn't happen as much today. It was much friendlier. People were much more open with each other. After every session, they would all get together, both parties, lobbyists and the press, and they would have a, you know, they would celebrate their day or whatever. And uh, it was a different era completely. Yeah. And there were a lot of giants in those days that served. Jim Florio, Bob Lewentz, Tom Kane, Millicent Fenwick. It was a tremendous group of, yeah. of, uh, of big people that uh, made history in New Jersey that were in the legislature in those days. It was a privilege for me to be there. I learned a lot from them. So and I'm very great, grateful for that opportunity. So you're moving on um, to uh, the Horizon Board. If I had a quarter for every retired uh, elected official who's on the Horizon Board, I'd be a millionaire. But I know. Uh, what do you want to do there at the Horizon Board? Well, you know, first of all, it's an exciting challenge. Uh, you know, this is a new chapter in my life. I've, I've served for many years. I've enjoyed it. Uh, but as I said, times have changed. Your word meant something. Uh, people don't understand that when the press calls, you answer. When your constituents call, you work for them. Uh, I'm not. I'm not being negative. I think it's a lack of of history and experience. Times have changed so much. So, let's get on to the uh, horizon board. First of all, it's a nomination that has to be offered. Uh, with all the trouble in healthcare, et cetera, this is a wonderful time to be there. You see what's happened in terms of costs, et cetera. So I'm, I'm not. I'm excited about being on the board. So uh, I know what you're saying. There are a lot of retired people there, but there, there are people that are very, very talented, and it's a, it's a great time to, to try to solve problems. You're, you're retiring voluntarily. Can we say that fairly? I would say I think so. I think if I wanted to run, the Chairman uh, Leroy Jones would have supported me. But I looked at my age, and some of the, to be honest with you, some of the health problems I've had over the last year or two, it's time to go. It's well, you, you're you're a spry 82. Let me tell you that uh, for sure. You had a uh, you had a period in the casino industry, and, and still you're you're chairing a tourism and gaming and the arts uh, industry. Let me ask you a couple quick questions about that. One, um, do you still or or do you support expansion of of casino gambling? Well, I would say that the, the, the story is not fully told at this point. Uh, it, 
what we did in the in the legislature was save the gaming business in New Jersey by giving them internet gaming and sports betting. Without that, I don't think if you look at the figures, you'll see a large portion of the revenue is coming from online gaming and sports getting sports betting. So we bailed them out. Uh, in the next few years, if it doesn't hold up because of the competition in New York, Pennsylvania, and other places, we should probably consider as a defensive move uh, to relocate gaming in the state. It's not about Atlantic City. It's about the gaming business. So here's my, hmm? here's my other question about online gambling, which you were uh, involved in a lot. There is ample evidence to suggest now that uh, online gambling is becoming an addiction uh, almost at crisis levels with our young people. Do you have any regret that you pushed that so hard? Well, I think there were unintended consequences with sports betting and internet gaming, and I have a resolution, and I hope we can vote on it before not too long in the future, that would, you know, call upon these companies to moderate uh, what they've done. During COVID, this addiction has caught on, uh, and many of our young people are are gambling, which is uh, really inappropriate for them. Yeah. And I think the over-the-top marketing is what's aided and abetted this uh, addiction of people, not only youth people, not only young people, but other people that have been home too long. You would put so a restriction I, I, I also have a bill in that's going to stop these universities from contracting uh, with uh, sports betting or internet companies to get stipends. Uh, it's absolutely uh, unconscionable that in some states this has already occurred. Uh, that's got to end. We've also heard, as as we know, that there's a lot of turnover uh, in the legislature. Uh, a lot of folks are saying the job is just not what it used to be, not as much fun. The bosses are in too much of control. Are, are you leaving at just the right time? Uh, well, is there a right time? The right time has to be for you as an individual. Yeah. And when I look at my age... And I look at the things I've accomplished and that I want to accomplish. I think I'll be there for a while. I think it's the proper time. And it also give other people an opportunity to serve. Some people have suggested that the job is just not as much fun as it used to be. It's not as much fun because it's more complicated. There are more issues to deal with. Uh, we want to talk about the 60s. The biggest thing they had to worry about was the sales tax. Right. Now we've got to provide billions of dollars for tax relief. Uh, for uh, real estate, for people to get a break. I mean, the world has changed so much over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Can't compare those these two errors. This is, this is a, here, I'm going to make this statement, and I hope you understand. If you care about a job, it's hard. If you don't care, it's easy. The job is very easy when you don't care. I care. And I think... Uh, it reaches a point where you got to have the energy and the desire to do it. I do it seven days a week. I'm a full-time legislator. So I understand the constituent work here, we don't fool around. We work at this all the time. And uh, so the, the, it is different from what it was. It's tough. All right. We have not heard the last, I don't think, from Assemblyman Ralph Caputo. Good to see you, man. Glad to finally get you on. You're the best, David. I really appreciate this opportunity. You've always been terrific. Thanks so much. All right, panel, Matt, Brent, Ken, welcome to you all. Matt, we're losing uh, count of the changing faces in the legislature. Caputo's from the Johnson administration, one of the last full-time um, lawmakers. Uh, are we done seeing changes there? Uh, well, I mean, this is the year we, uh, we learn who retires. Uh, so uh, we have others, you know, I, I think it's universally accepted that uh, Senator Cunningham will not be returning uh, after this year, though she has not, you know, formally announced anything. Uh, I've lost count of the numbers. I think it's above average for our turnover, probably not unprecedented right now. But, you know, this is the time of year they shake these things out and we get the uh, new blood in. But certainly Ralph is, uh, of course, there was a big gap between his service, but it really yeah. is losing uh, a lot of the institutional memory. Even Dick Cody doesn't go as far back in the legislature as Ralph goes, even though he has longer continuous service. Yeah. Uh, Brent, it should make the legislative elections pretty interesting, at least. Does it impact voters, though? I mean, do they think like, hey, this is a good thing since they otherwise can't stand politicians? Maybe some new blood will reengage voters? 
Yeah, I don't know. This is an interesting election to watch. Well, first of all, a lot of people don't even know who their state lawmakers are, so I don't know how much that plays into it. But someone like Ralph, who has a fascinating story and was always very helpful to reporters and called us back immediately, um, <laughs> it is a bit different because he's been there so long. He's a name. But yeah, this is just a fascinating election to watch in general because Democrats are trying to hold on control of the legislature and Republicans are trying to make take control of at least one chamber for the first time in 20 years which is a long stretch. So th this a lot could happen in the next few months, and especially in November. Yeah. All right. Kenny, I know you were glued to our coverage of the governor's budget address. Uh, why don't you start off our budget observations? Any takeaways other than there's a next New Jersey either coming or already here, evidently? Any highlights for you? Such a segue, considering what you guys just spoke about. It's an election year budget for me. It's, I mean... We, a couple of weeks ago, we had Governor Murphy addressing some business concerns, and this budget does address that a little bit with the sunset of the uh, of the uh, two and a half percent tax. But it now addresses to the things that people will generally like: the property tax relief, uh, investment in education. So, and then of course, uh, I, I'm of the opinion that you're going to have some disagreement on the other side of the aisle, no matter what. But it's an election year bu budget. It doesn't really rock the boat all that much. Matt, is the next New Jersey in the metaverse? I think you wrote that. Uh, he said that phrase 16 times. Was that supposed to be the takeaway? And if so, uh, yeah. was it defined I, well or at all? I mean, he, he said it a lot. Yeah. But he did. He defined. <laughs> see, this is what I said. I think I, I wrote in New Jersey playbook that it, he said the next New Jersey, we don't have to wait for it. It's here right now. And as I, you know, I wrote in playbook, that's temporarily impossible. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> that, that, false. Um, so, uh, no, I think it's, you know, I think the next New Jersey, if you boil it down, what he says it is about being it's it's the uh, phrase he used for the last uh, five years, stronger and fairer in New Jersey. Right. It means the same thing. It's just a different turn of phrase and perhaps, a, you know, positioning uh, for him to, you know, obviously we look through everything through the 2024 lens. I don't know how helpful that is right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's 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 just a, a political phrase. It doesn't really um, mean anything specific as, as far as I can tell. But he sure said it a lot. Yeah. So, Brent, we were asking on Tuesday if this was going to be a budget that reflected the governor's priorities or the legislature's priorities, because the governor's not up for election and the entire legislature is. Is it clear whose priorities are represented in this plan? Well, I think it's both, because you also have you have a, a governor who's being talked about as a possible pr possible presidential candidate and tax cuts or property tax rebates, more specifically, you know, go go well for everybody in, in some respect, although the Republicans say it's it's not it, there should be more direct relief. So I think, yes, it's definitely uh, there to bolster Democrats as they try to hold on to the legislature in November. But, you know, it, it can't hurt a guy who's, who's clearly trying to bolster his national reputation. I mean, you end up with a 10 billion dollar surplus. It's rare that you hear people complain that there's too much money in reserve, right? Yeah, I well, if you're running, I if you're running for re-election, you have to find something to, to be upset about. Yeah. All right. Let's yeah, I just think this budget is, well, Go ahead, you're Matt. just seeing a flush budget, a lot of state revenue, flush budget. Um, not that, you know, you have a big reserve, but, you know, if the economy turns, there are no fundamental uh, structural changes in this budget. And I certainly didn't expect there to be any that really uh, change the state's position in case things uh, really take a turn south. In case you have another great recession, you're going to have to do a lot of budget reckoning again, sort of like what we saw in the Chris Christie era. Of course, Christie, you know, those first uh, tough budgets also didn't structurally reform anything. And, uh, you know, we'll be we, we are. We've got a lot of years to go. At least, you know, the pension payments are on the right path. But uh, this is the same stuff as always. It's just bigger. You know, this property tax relief, if times go bad, that's getting cut. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's talk. Let's talk transparency. Uh, and before we get too deep into this, let's um, extend props to Politico for first sharing the news about this so-called Election Transparency Act, which, among other things, uh, attempted to strip the autonomy of the Election Law Enforcement Commission by giving the governor authority to appoint the executive director. 
Matt, it started as a spark uh, late last week, and it blew up on Monday. The pretty terrible blunder, no? Yeah, you know, and I always say, you know, watch what these guys do in Trenton, not what they say. They can justify all they want after the fact what they tried to do. Um, it was a Thursday evening, and after actually debating this bill, then all of a sudden the Senate Judiciary Committee, I think it was Judiciary, maybe it was Budget, don't hold me to it, uh, yeah. breaks, and uh, suddenly they insert this amendment that takes away ELEC's autonomy, um, you know, without any discussion. Th it was done in a sneaky way on purpose. They try to get away with this stuff. And, you know, our job in the press is to try to catch them as, as, as much as possible when they try this. Um, it was, I, don't, I still don't understand fully why. Now, the Murphy administration has been trying to force Jeff Brindle, the executive director of ELEC, out of his job. Uh, because of an email he wrote that was, you know, it was it was an inappropriate email uh, about National Coming Out Day. And he lamented not being able to ce celebrate President's Day, which is a state holiday, you know, essentially President's Day, uh, but celebrating National Coming Out Day, which isn't a state holiday. OK, but does that really justify um, the governor's office coming in and taking over an agency uh, that oversees the governor as a candidate that oversees mm. every candidate in the state of New Jersey from school board on up and giving the governor an opportunity to place a political person in charge of that agency. Come on. You know, that that can't be the real reason. And to be totally honest with you, I still don't know why they tried this power grab. Yeah. Uh, Brent, my the... question is, why would they even try to do anything involving an election, especially if you think about what happened, you know, two, three years ago, where you had uh, different, well, particularly a lot of Republican appointees within the last couple of years trying to change how elections are done. Everybody's antenna is up. It's something you don't want to mess with right now. Yeah. Uh, third rail kind of thing. Brent, uh, the Senate president says the bill's not dead. Do we know if, in fact, the, the offending amendment uh, came from the administration? No, I mean, they're... There have been rumors, and and I don't think that this amendment's going to survive. In fact, Nick Scatari said as much the other day. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it'll still be a good bill. This bill was already controversial before this happened. So, you know, because who, who there's knows other stuff in there other than, um, uh, you know, the the elec stuff. I mean, they're, they're the bill would allow us a slush fund essentially for local campaigns to what handle uh, housekeeping stuff. Yeah, and I, I think that's good. And, you know, Skitari sort of justified that by saying, you know, people want to donate for political reasons. But come on, money is fungible. If you're if you're donating to one part, then that's money they don't have to spend on the other. Uh, what difference does it make, honestly? I think, though, ultimately, some of the more controversial provisions are about expanding, you know, increasing contribution limits. And there's certainly a very legitimate argument for that, because money has completely uh, surrounded politics through nonprofit organizations, through super PACs. And uh, it makes sense in a lot of ways to loosen the reins on campaign contributions so at least you get some accountability. Um, the problem is that in addition to this, they tried to defang elect by putting a two-year statute of limitations on uh, how long it can act on something. And... Uh, well, that's the irony basically there going is, to kill of course, all their have, investigations. The irony there is, of course, they have, what, two or three people total to investigate what could be, you know, countless uh, investigations, and you, you can't get to it in two years, frankly. No, it's, uh, I mean, that's a pretty transparent attempt to hobble yeah. the agency, and frankly, one that will get the big three Democratic committees out of likely paying the tens of thousands of dollars um, they'll have to pay if ELEC substantiates its uh, January complaints against them from an audit of the 2017 election that they yeah. did. All right. Uh, the governor's budget proposes a second year of the anchor program. The deadline uh, for the first year was this week. Kenny, uh, was the program a success? It's... It's off to a good start. I think the last number that I saw was 1.7 million signed up uh, of those who were eligible, which was about 2 million. Uh, I know it was a slow start uh, this first go round, uh, and they're going to try. I'm I'm terming it this way. They're going to try again next year to see how many more people can sign up or how many of the uh, leftover people could not or who will uh, sign up for the program uh, 
uh, assuming that it survives the budget. But for right now, um, it wasn't a terrible start, but so far it's a solid start. Yeah. This Waterford Commission, uh, Brent, can you explain to people in, in 30 seconds why New Jersey wants to get out and why New York wants to stay in? Um, in terms of New Jersey, you know, the governor said that it, it, it's outserved its purpose and it's time for New Jersey to get out, uh, even though New Jersey it, it was was the reason it was started, right. um, you know, going going back many years. So I'm, I'm not I'm not certain many people understand what's going on, but it's something that Murphy has continued to push in recent months. Yeah. Um, Can I just say Matt, it's a little curious? The whole thing's a little curious. Uh, the zeal with which New Jersey officials have sought to leave this agency, which is about fighting corruption. Uh, frankly, I haven't seen really. They, they say, oh, it's outdated. It's this and that. I haven't seen it. They haven't right. put it out there the ways that this agency has actually um, negatively supposedly affected anything. The agency has thrown a lot of money around. Um, honestly, I think the whole thing's sketchy, but uh you know, the Supreme Court appears ready to side with New Jersey based on the way they took their arguments, which really doesn't surprise me because the Supreme Court has um, really basically legalized a lot of corruption uh, across the country. So, you know, there you go. Yeah. Uh, let me stick with you here, Matt. Jonathan Salant, one of uh, the most veteran D.C. reporters uh, for uh, advanced media, uh, was let go this week along with several New Jersey photogs. It, it was a real glimpse into the erosion of local news. No, in this case, we're losing a Jersey perspective on D.C. Yeah, now there will be no uh, reporters covering New Jersey's yeah. congressional delegation from uh, a Jersey angle. And uh, I just, you know, I've said a lot about this. I've said about a lot about the stupid stuff that is appearing on NJ.com very frequently now. Uh, I, I, I do not believe that we need to know about a Qdoba opening in brick or wherever, okay? <laughs> I don't think it's important. But I will say, one thing that really uh, grinds my gears is that when you read about these, when you see the staff memo uh, from NJ Advanced Media announcing laying off uh, Jonathan and announcing laying off a bunch of their photographers, they use this corporate, like, double speak, yeah. gobble will be just crap. And it's like we're journalists, we're paid to see through this crap, and then you feed it right back to us. It's an insult. We are increasing by decreasing. Kenny, but, put yeah, on your... It's like we, we are better focusing for our community <laughs> needs by laying off the people. Who, like, when was the last time you covered a regular council meeting? If there isn't already controversy to begin with. When was the last time NJ.com sent a reporter to just a normal council meeting, even in Newark, the biggest city in the state, they don't do it? Kenny... Put on your Society of Professional Journalism hat. Uh, let me give you the word on uh, uh, the critical importance of local news. It's very important. In fact, and I was thinking about this. Imagine my hometown newspaper, the Washington Post, not having anybody covering Congress. And it's down the street from their offices. Think about how further ignorant we are as a society if we do not have eyes on what's happening in the government. And for a state like New Jersey, even though we're small, even though half the state is in the New York market, half the state is in the Philadelphia market, the state itself is a news desert, which is frustrating. Uh, the folks, and I'm trying not to step on toes too hard, I might stomp on them a little bit, but we... We need people in D.C. to report on things happening to New Jersey. I mean, it's quite telling that you have all your congressional de delegation, except one, just back up Jonathan Salant. And for my money, I would put the report, keep the report just to keep an eye on that one who didn't want to support my job. You know, <laughs> it's like you don't want uh, you don't want the scrutiny. And and I, I share the same opinion that. It's nice to have all these fun facts about New Jersey, like the best restaurant and the best pizza. But what's happening in Trenton municipal government? What's happening in Newark's municipal government? In fact, I've, Isaac Alvusio, who is late of the Trentoni, he's now with Axios in Philadelphia. We would not know the hot mess the Trenton City Council was on a regular basis last term if it wasn't for his dogged reporting. NJ Advance, you need to do better. All right, time for our only in Jersey moment. Headlines and notes that are quintessentially Jersey. 
Matt, why don't you start us off? Uh, well, I think uh, I just wrote about South Jersey right now. One of the, the the interesting thing here is South Jersey Republicans are are split right now, are fighting amongst themselves about what kind of candidates they run in uh, two very uh, competitive districts, District Three, where they upset Democrats uh, famously in 2021, and ousted Senate President Sweeney and his Assembly running mates. And um, in District Four, where Senator Fred Madden hasn't announced what he's doing yet, most people think he's going to retire. And uh, basically, a Durr ally, acolyte, the guy who is married to Durr's chief of staff, Nick DeSilvio, is running in the fourth legislative district. And just like Durr, DeSilvio has a bunch of social media posts that are like, you know, very stridently anti abortion. He calls people who support abortion evil, uh, doesn't believe, you know, it wrote that he didn't believe abortion was ever medically necessary. Uh, and uh, disparaged Muslims. I think, you know, on his about page, he was like, I, I love Jesus. There's no Muslims here. And so Republicans are like, all right, so 2021, we, some Republicans, they say 2021, we caught lightning in a bottle. Uh, 2022, you saw the abortion issue turn around on Republicans after the overturn, overturn of uh, Roe v. Wade. And so what the hell are we doing? You know, they think they attribute their 22 loss in the Gloucester County Commission race to this kind of sort of extremism that Democrats exploited uh, in campaign ads against them. And so there's a fight right now over what kind of candidate do you run in these competitive districts? And they feel like they could blow it. Like this stuff I'm using, the social media stuff, I didn't get it from Democrats. I think they're, they have it. They're holding on to it. Uh, you know, this is a Republican fight. Yeah, a lot of their primaries are going to be who's right and who's writer. Uh, Brent, you got one for us? Yeah, I was recently in Cleveland uh, to, to do something for music, and uh, some the guy who was there who lives in Cleveland, I complained to him that I had to get out and pump my gas because it was very cold, and he was like, "You guys still haven't changed that," and I said, "I don't think New Jersey will ever change that." So, and also, I, I want to say um, uh, I'm going to miss working with Jonathan Salant. He's been a mentor and a friend and a fellow Mets fan uh, for many years, and he's really the mayor of uh, the, the capital in DC, yeah, no and um, he's going to be missed. Yeah, great guy. And, I, you know, I'm just learning now that he's a Mets fan, which makes him even cooler. Yes, uh, mine does. comes <laughs> from close to home. Uh, Hoboken, water, water everywhere, but not a do drop to drink. Uh, the city, which has, uh, was left with no water for two days this week after a couple of water mains collapsed there. Uh, nothing new for the waterfront city, which sits below sea level and floods when it's cloudy. But this week, the entire city went dry. Schools and restaurants closed. Hospitals had to move patients out of town. And the wonderful image of porta potties stations across the city was a new low for the low-lying Miles Square City, whose infrastructure dates to the turn of the last century. Veolia is the water company there, and PSC&G uh, officials say they had a hard time finding the source of the leaks because the underground water infrastructure has changed so much. It's over 100 years old and nobody knows what pipes connect to what water mains. And if you live in Hoboken for even a minute, that sounds just about right. And that's Roundtable for this week. Matt, Brent, Kenny, good to see you all. Thanks also to Ralph Caputo for joining us. You can follow the show on Twitter at RoundtableNJ and find all kind of fresh content every day when you subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'm David Cruz from the entire crew here at Gateway Center in downtown Newark. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz is provided by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Business Magazine, the magazine of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, reporting to executive and legislative leaders in all 21 counties of the Garden State since 1954, and by Politico's New Jersey Playbook, a topical newsletter on Garden State politics, online at politico.com.